Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, the Bishara Trust. Thank you, everyone, for coming out this afternoon. Can you hear me yes. at the back? All right. I thought I was, I thought I was going to be amplified. Can you hear me? Okay, I'll try and project. Um, as Elizabeth said, when I was first asked to give this talk, I came up with the theme uh, which I'd been thinking about for some time. Once I started wondering what I was going to write about, I thought, this is very overreaching. So I should start by stating that I have no credentials whatsoever to speak on these subjects as a philosopher or a theologian or a historian, and I am not in any conventional sense of the term a believer. I'm not a member of a religion nor a strict follower of a prophetic tradition. I am interested in how these terms, atheism, agnosticism, belief, shift meaning depending on the context in which they're used, and especially in what the experience is of looking at the world and ourselves through each of these lenses. The interest is purely personal. For the past 10 years or so, I have joined a group of friends for weekly silent meditation. And it was probably at least five years in before any of us asked each other how it was we'd come to meditation. After I had described a little of my experience at the Bashara school, one of my friends said to me, I wish I were a believer. I was quite taken aback, as I would not have defined myself that way. Not long after, I read the best-selling books on atheism by Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens with a different group of friends, two of whom are here today, I'm so pleased to see, and found I was one of few in the room who did not clearly identify as an atheist. For the record, I don't think of myself as an agnostic either. So where does that leave me? Apparently, with an increasing number of the population of both Great Britain and the United States who identify as unaffiliated, the fastest growing category in both the 2011 British Census and a recent U.S. Pew Research poll on religion, which includes the religious and secular unaffiliated. I personally would in no way equate unaffiliated with uncommitted and would state my religious path, if there were such a category, as wanting to see things how they really are, regardless of how they might be described by another. And I might also say, if there were enough room on the form, that although atheism, agnosticism, and belief appear to be in contradiction with each other, at times each one takes on a lens which seems appropriate through which to look at the world. We are all of us in the 21st century profoundly impacted by modern science and what might be called its artistic response, modernism. The project of modernism, so often derided for bringing about moral relativity in a godless world, has been hugely helpful at sweeping away illusion and breaking through perceptual barriers. The arts at their best do such a good job of conveying meaning without being definitive. So I wanted to explore this subject with the help of a few favorite paintings and a little through the lens of science. Welcome. <laughs> Some of you may have been privileged to have seen the exhibition Ice Age Art at the British Museum last year. This was described as the arrival of the modern mind 
and showcased a number of exquisite sculptures, mostly found in northern Europe from as far back as 40,000 years. We know nothing at all about the beliefs, rituals, social orders, gods, goddesses, spirits of the people who made these. But what was so moving in gazing at them was how obviously they communicated a sense of transcendence. The curators made clear that each of the pieces would have taken months to make given the tools available and that therefore for a hunter-gatherer society they must have held huge significance. But the pieces themselves without this information conveyed powerfully their purpose to connect with a higher order the way all sacred art does or I should say all good art and at least while I was there there was a palpable sense a kind of reverence on the part of the attendees to be in the presence of these far far distant humans relatives search interestingly the curators chose to show these works alongside art by Henry Moore, Mondrian, Matisse, and others. This is Henry Moore on the right. Artists of the modern movement, which movement consciously broke with the tradition of explaining the context of images? So the two periods of art were in easy dialogue with each other. One had no known spiritual context and the other deliberately avoided it. And to quote the catalogue, each showed the fundamental human desire to communicate and make art as a way of understanding ourselves and the world. This is Matisse. Over the past 40,000 years, of course, we have evidence of human belief in innumerable forms, statues, paintings, writings, buildings from throughout the world. We know more or less about the details of these beliefs, but the objects themselves convey a transcendent and compelling meaning. Why else do we unearth, collect, display and admire them so? For more than a thousand years, of course, European art, literature, music, architecture has been deeply entwined with the story of Christianity. In its various forms, and notwithstanding the major convulsions which have taken place within it, it remained for over a millennium the imaginative presence within which the vast majority of Europeans lived. Most of them, up until the 19th century, would have been baptized, married, and buried within one or other Christian church. The Old and New Testaments provided the images and stories, the sense of beginning and end, the moral framework, which were all shared. It's worth remembering this when we look back on the great crisis of faith which began to shatter the Christian narrative with the dramatic discoveries of the 19th century. In the late 18th century, the Scottish geologist James Hutton, after, after careful observation of the sedimentary layers of earth on his Berwickshire farm, yeah. began to overturn the prevailing theories of the Neptunists who had been seeking to find evidence in geology for Noah's flood. Hutton described a universe very different from the biblical cosmos, one formed by a continuous cycle in which rocks and soil are washed into the sea, compacted into bedrock, forced up to the surface by volcanic processes and eventually worn away into sediment again. The result, therefore, of this physical inquiry, Hutton concluded, 
is that we find no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. Hutton was accused of being atheist, of contradicting biblical truth. Hutton's theories strongly influenced Darwin, who after close study of the Galapagos finches' beaks, among other things, developed his theory of evolution, and we all know how unsettling that was. These, with other discoveries of the period, were of course not the first to have upended prevailing beliefs, Galileo providing a prime example. But the data-driven discoveries of the 19th century began in Europe and America a seismic undermining of the creation story, and something began to unravel. The physical world would no longer be investigated for evidence of religious truth. The reverse. Belief was to be put aside to allow for an unimpeded observation. The approach the scientists would adopt while observing data would be atheist, whatever their private belief, if they had one. Scientific objectivity requiring the view from nowhere, as the philosopher Thomas Nagel has called it, however unattainable, has been the accepted approach ever since. We attempt to allow the world to tell us what it is, rather than look to it for proof of pre-existing beliefs. We can try to imagine what it would have been like at the time to absorb these bombshells. Our own grandparents and great-grandparents had to confront what this meant for their own belief. The majority of Christians and Jews now in Europe and even in America in spite of the flourishing Creation Museum in Kentucky, which disproves Darwin, do not find the theory of evolution makes biblical truth meaningless. It does not shatter their faith, and they found a variety of ways to live with both versions of the truth. But in 1851, coincidentally, the same year that Darwin stopped going to church, Matthew Arnold expressed the shattering loss of faith in his mournful elegy on Dover Beach, which ends with the lines, Ah, love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. I first came across this poem as a teenager and loved it. I was not a brooding melancholic, and I did not at all believe that the world no longer held joy, but in the way that poetry can get its hooks into you and carry meanings beyond words, I took to this one and have come back to it over the years, giving it another go. And now I deeply appreciate his evocation of the facing of the loss of everything felt dear, everything he thought he knew. And of course that, our love let us be true to one another, makes all the difference. Because if love and truth remain, we actually can let go of the rest. This loss of faith was the preamble to modernism. The developments in art, architecture, literature, music, dance, theater, which rejected the certainties of enlightenment thinking and religious belief and which the world found so shocking. We can trace this briefly and not at all comprehensively 
by looking at this evolving in a few pieces of art from the last 120 years or so. Starting with the Impressionists, who embarked on this process of learning to see without the visual image referring to something but simply allowing it to awaken the perception of light and color. These were radicals in their time, violating the rules of academic painting, painting outdoors, looking to capture momentary and transitory effects of light. These paintings here are from the, Paris, the first Paris exhibition of 1874, which caused such an uproar. What is so interesting is how easy it is to love these now. So much so they're sometimes snobbishly dismissed, and we have to struggle to recapture the drama of that first startling view. Uh, Monique Pizarro here. There's a wonderful quote, somebody going, what is this? What are we looking at here? And they're going, well, it's hoarfrost on a ploughed furrows. Furrows? They don't look like furrows. It's just palette scrapings. Well, perhaps, but it's the impression is there. Well, funny kind of impression is where they got their name from. So not appreciated at all at the time. And this from Cezanne. An over-exclusive love of yellow has compromised his future. <laughs> In the same way that the theory of evolution does not rattle most of us now, these paintings have just happily settled into our lives. A few years later, Van Gogh, now apparently the most popular painter in the world, struggled alone to find, as he said in a letter to his brother Theo, the high yellow. A search which at the time only Theo and Gauguin might have understood, but which we can recognize so easily now as a transcendent quest. Now that yellow is so ubiquitous, we have to struggle to see past the endless reproductions to embrace the height he was searching for. By the time we reach Mondrian, we are moving into abstraction. This from 1909, 1913 and 1936. The First World War has happened, the um, general theory of relativity has been published, all representational forms are abandoned. This is Mondrian talking. Today one is tired of the dogmas of the past and of truths once accepted but successfully jettisoned. One realizes more and more the relativity of everything, and therefore one tends to reject the idea of fixed laws, of a single truth. The important task of all art is to destroy the static equilibrium by establishing a dynamic one. Non-figurative art demands the destruction of a particular form and the construction of a rhythm of mutual relations. These artists are on fire on a mission to open eyes to light and color and line unencumbered by the forms to which they are habitually attached. They are not using art to tell a story or establish a belief but using it to ask questions and provoke insight. Of course, all great art does this and has always done so, but in modernism it's done overtly. This is Alexander Calder from 1948 saying, 
Just as one can compose colors and forms, so one can compose motions. This is one of his mobile.